Hello, good morning. This is Taib at Taibs.com and today we're going to take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5 and I'm going to give you a quick introduction and then we are going to look at the passage itself. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you guys have uh, quoted several verses from 2 Corinthians 10, especially verse 5 and I've quoted it and, and it reads like this and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So I use this verse as a command, as if I had to take my polluted thought captive to obey Christ. And I don't know how some of you guys have used uh, this verse and personally applied it to your life, but it is imperative that we truly understand what Paul was communicating to the Corinthian church under the Holy Spirit uh, tutelage when he was writing this letter. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. So uh, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to read the passage, understand the background, and then get into uh, all the, the good stuff. So let's do that. Now, first let's uh, read verse 3 to 5. Okay. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, first we need to understand why Paul wrote those uh, verse, those those two, like those words up there. So we're going to look at verse 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians 10, okay? So I'm, I'm going to exit this and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 2. Now he says here, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm away. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. So you kind of have an idea what's going on here, right? There were basically people that were questioning Paul's authority. Like they, they kind of felt like they could talk about him in such a light manner, almost disrespectful. Okay, they were questioning his ministry and they were questioning what kind of authority that Paul had and and you all know every letter of Paul most of his letters when he started the letters he he, he starts with this uh, this appellation he goes Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God okay most of Paul's letters started that way that's for a reason because he wanted to establish who he was he wasn't just self-made he didn't make himself an apostle. He didn't just decide to be an apostle. But he specifically said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. So God appointed Paul to be an apostle. So Paul didn't just make himself an apostle or a teacher. So he was actually backed up by God himself. That's what he, was, he wanted his, his uh, audience to understand. That's the first thing. So even though Paul said these things, there were troublemakers in the Corinthian church that went as far as saying that Paul's letters were, like they used this word, like in First and Second Corinthians 10.10, 10, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. This is the kind of disrespectful uh, things they said about Paul. So they wanted to discredit Paul and consequently take his letters and exhortations lightly. And that could lead to a serious problem, like in the whole congregation. Like when you allow stuff like this to happen, it can it can become like cancerous. Like all it does is one or two people to spread this kind of bad ideas and thoughts, and the next thing you know, everybody begins to think like 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 this, and then what happens is the entire church becomes polluted. So, and and notice how these guys attacked his manliness with the sole intention of questioning and discrediting his authority. That's what they wanted to do. And Paul wasn't going to have that, saying we're going to see how Paul came back, what kind of wisdom he used, and we are going to look at that. So, and this is Paul's response. 
he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So Paul, when he initially wrote this letter, and he wrote those uh, three to five, those verses in Second Corinthians 10, he was actually giving an answer to those people that were questioning his authority as an apostle. Okay? He goes, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Paul is basically saying that even though he and his companions are humans, they do not use human means, arguments, or opinions to engage in any battle that come their way. In this case, it was the attack on the authority of Paul. So he gives the reasons for his statement in verse 3 by following it with verse 4. He gives the means of his uh, battle. Like, how does he fight? What kind of weapons he use? And that's what he talks about in verse 4. He goes, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. He describes the origin and power of the means that he and his companions in the faith use to engage in battle. The means are of God. That's the, the, that's the, uh, the, the, orig uh, the, the means, the weapons. They are of God. They come from God. And then because they come from God, they have divine power and the divine power of God to destroy and bring to nothing strongholds. These weapons and means do not find their roots in humans' cleverness, philosophies, and ideologies. They are rooted in God's character and have God's power attached to them. That's what Paul is saying. And he goes on to describe what the strongholds, uh, the strongholds are in verse 5. So first thing he wants to say, listen, we don't fight like every other human being. We don't use human means. We don't use human's argument. We don't use human philosophies. We don't use cleverness. We don't use that kind of stuff to engage in battle. Because even though we are humans, we do, we do not fight like other people do. We don't use those arguments. We're not trying to get clever. Because the weapons that we use and the means that we use have divine power. Because they come from God. They are God's thoughts, God's argument, and they have God's power attached to them. So that's what Paul is saying. And the, the power of God can destroy strongholds. And then he goes on to describe what the strongholds are. So we're going to look at the, the strongholds in the next um, slide. What are the strongholds? And let's look at verse 5. So these are the strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So what are the strongholds? The strongholds are arguments and arrogant opinions that cloud people's understanding or knowledge of God. They find their roots in human reasoning and stand high and lofty like a fortress, opposing any entry that might lead to the knowledge of God. They can't be destroyed by mere like human reasoning, but only by the power of God through God's own reasoning. Once those arguments are de and described in the form of a fortress are destroyed, the thoughts behind them, like the, the prisoners, are exposed, and then those thoughts are taken captive to obey God. Basically, what this is saying is this. When the argument of the opponent of God is destroyed, he or she has no other alternative but to submit himself or herself to the truth found in Jesus. So Paul was basically saying to the, to the people, Listen, you are not fighting against me. You are fighting against God himself. I'm just a messenger. But what you don't understand is the power behind me is not me, but the power behind me is God himself. So, and this is the power behind Paul's weapons. And we're going to see Paul in action in Athens to fully understand this passage. Okay, so we're going to look at what Paul did when he went to Athens in the Areopagus. So I'm going to actually play this and I'm going to go first as let's go to Acts 17 and we are going to play this thing so i'm gonna play it and then so what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna read these sections of Acts 17 
We're going to read from Acts uh, 17, verse 16 through 34. I did not want to read this, but I'm going to have to read it. So please follow with me. I'm going to go extremely slow, and we are going to read this section. So Paul is in Athens, okay? And I'm, I'm picking it up from Acts 16, uh, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, and that's because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Now, let's read uh, Paul's address. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the whole world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the whole world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So now I'm going to go back here and let's present. So basically, I basically set the stage for you. Like, Paul goes to Athens, he sees that he walks through the city, and he sees that the whole place is, is given to idolatry, so his spirit is troubled within him. So he goes to the Areopagus, and he gives some kind of a speech there to defend his case. So among the least leading uh, ideologies and philosophies there were the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers. And their lifestyles and ideologies were rooted in man's effort or man's ways. They were putting a lot of emphasis on man's meritorious achievement. That's basically the Stoic philosophers. They were just like elev elevating man's uh, self-achievement, righteousness to the level of God. And the Epicurean, whose lives were centered around pleasure, they were elevating man's sensual needs again above God's laws. And there were many other religious like practices represented there. They had like some form of godliness, but they were just mere like human inventions. So this is what Paul was against. But as he mentioned in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, verse 3 to 5, the means he used to argue his point were centered on God's wisdom and they had divine power to break down falsehood and pseudo-truths in order to take uh, thoughts captive to obey Christ. Now among the captives in the Areopagus was the Areopagite uh, Dionysius, 
a woman named Damaris, and others uh, whose names are mentioned. So Paul's labor was not in vain. So God specifically sent him there for the people he had sovereignly uh, like chosen to save. And so Paul was successful because it was the Holy Spirit who worked through Paul for the conviction and saving of Damaris, Dionysius, and the unnamed other folks. So this is the confidence that we have in God. We don't win souls for Christ on the basis of clever human arguments, but we do so by submitting ourselves to the leadership of the, the Holy Spirit, who does his work of regenerating men's hearts by exposing the lies they have been under their whole entire life. So when Paul went to, to the Areopagus, his chief purpose, which he may have not known, was to save Dionysius Damaris and the other one whose names are mentioned. So Paul went there. He did not use like human arguments. His argument was basically based on God's own thoughts and he had God's power because the reason why I'm saying this is because Dionysius was saved, Damaris was saved, and the other one that I mentioned were saved. God chose them and he sent Paul there to destroy the strongholds and, and, and the lofty opinions that were raised against the knowledge of God. So when Dionysius heard those things when Damaris heard those things when the other people heard Paul speaking the strongholds came down and then their thoughts were exposed and now they were taken captive to obey Christ so therefore they followed Paul's uh, teachings you see what happens this is the process that Paul is describing in 2 Corinthians 10 and we see him in action now let's go back to uh, uh, what's the takeaway now first I would say this, this verse isn't necessarily a command for us to take our own uh, thoughts captive to obey Christ, but we must submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's scrutiny so that he can destroy the errors in our hearts, heresies, you know, false ideas, and anything that we may be thinking that stands against the knowledge of God. So we don't like do that ourselves but we come under the holy spirit's teaching through the word of god and god's word because he has power destroy the strongholds in our mind and bring those lies to the surface and then when we see those like we are undone and the holy spirit renew our minds by doing away with the accumulated lies we've believed over all these years and once god exposed those lies we are undone like i said and that's when change happens so we ourselves must take a hold of all these means of grace that God has provided, okay? And, and, and we're gonna take, we have to take a hold of all these uh, means of grace in our dealings with other people. We don't win souls by arguing our way. We use arguments that have their roots in God's character, God's origin, and God's power, okay? And we must do so by faith in the sense that we can't do it in our own strength. It's God that has to command us. God sent Paul to the Areopagus, and he's going to send us to places where there are people there that he has sovereignly chosen to save. And as we go, we bring the words of God, and we bring God's power because God is sending us. So therefore, God gets the glory. We don't get the glory because we are the messengers. So this is the takeaway. And I will encourage you to really um, go back and read the scriptures more because we need to understand that uh, we're not waging war according to the flesh but our weapons have uh power divine power to destroy strongholds okay we take captive every falsehood and thought that's raised against the knowledge of god and we destroy them by the means of god himself so when we argue we are not arguing from a, a place of human reasoning but we are using sometimes human words but are disposing and dispensing uh, spiritual truths that the Holy Spirit himself is putting in our minds through the word of God. And then we have God's power because God is the one sending us there. So we are not going into this battlefield with our own weapons. God himself has equipped us with his word, with his power in the Holy Spirit and to defeat the enemy and to bring captives in order to, to, to make them obey God. And this is the truth that we have and this is the word of God. So we must remember that we need to rely fully on God's means of grace. Okay, I will encourage you to read that passage more and um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Okay, have a wonderful day. Thank you.